I want to bring us back to the prophet of Isaiah. We covered the first 12 chapters uh, in late 2018, early 2019, and want to come back uh, to this wonderful book. Isaiah never fails to thrill as we uh, read his vivid uh, metaphors uh, that have given his prophecy is a really a literary and a theological masterpiece, as many have said. Uh, it combines history and theology and eschatology all wrapped up in one. Uh, Isaiah was the prophet of the Lord, the mouthpiece of the Lord, the spokesman for the Lord in the uh, 8th century and early uh, 7th century BC. He saw the uh, downfall of the 10 northern tribes. You remember the, uh, the, the Israelites, the 12 tribes were divided from the northern to the south and the northern kingdom, those 10 tribes, he witnessed their downfall in uh, 722 or 23 BC. He spoke uh, to a nation that was divided uh, between not only the haves and the nots, uh, have nots was divided between north and south uh, the rich were getting richer and there was oppression in the land. Isaiah spoke to uh, believers who were going through the motions of worship, uh, those who were starting to lose their grip on the power in the, of the word of God and the law of God. It was losing its appeal to them. Isaiah spoke in a time of uncertainty. Uh, people were asking, what's going to happen next? Will we su survive if... If our oppressing brothers don't, don't uh, starve us out, uh, will the superpowers of the day squash us? And so it is a time similar to our time. You probably have heard, the, as I said, that sounds a lot like now, isn't it? The church is weak. People are divided. People are wondering what's going to happen next. And, and the question in the book of Isaiah is, who are we going to trust in such times? Uh, are we going to trust that they were tempted to trust the surrounding nations? They were tempted to, uh, to trust other gods. They were tempted to trust their own understanding. And the question comes to us as to who are we going to trust in these times? Well, chapters 1 through 12 serve sort of as a introduction to the book of Isaiah. God is calling his people back to himself in those chapters, warning them, uh, promising good to them, even singing to them in chapter 5. There's the great prophecies of, the, of Emmanuel in chapter 7 and 9, and then of the branch from Jesse in chapter 11. He even expresses his anger toward them. He even predicts their praise of him in chapter 12. And now in chapter 13, we move to the, the second section of Isaiah, chapter 13 through chapter 23. It, it's the hardest part of Isaiah to preach because it's all about judgment. And there are nine oracles that are given, uh, these, uh, or rather, ten oracles that are given, ten pronouncements upon the nations. Uh, one of those nations is even Israel. And there's 11 other nations that are mentioned there. Some are called an oracle, and so there's more than just 10. The oracle itself are 10, but there's 11 there. And why these nations? Because these are the surrounding nations of Israel at the time. This is the world that Isaiah knew. Uh, these are uh, all the people that are being threatened, or either threatening uh, Israel and all the other nations, or are, are the threatener, the oppressor. And the main point in all of these chapters is that Yahweh is the God of all the nations. That Yahweh is not a, a local deity. They, they thought in terms of each nation or people group had their own God. And when you were in their realm, that God was powerful. And if you moved into another realm, another God would be powerful. But Isaiah points out that, that Yahweh is the God of all nations. That he's the God of the whole world. As one theologian even stooped to say this week as I read him, he's got the whole world in his hands. That summarizes these chapters, that God is the God, the sovereign God of all the nations. And so hear this. This is going to be a little difficult to hear, not only because it's two chapters, but you'll just see the, the, the vivid imagery that speak out 
And I want you to have that bulletin outline if you have, that will help you through it. But we'll find uh, all kinds of images here that we need to understand. But let the word of God come to you and flow out from my lips to, to your heart. Uh, this is the word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 13. An oracle concerning Babylon that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. Raise a banner on the, a bare hilltop. Shout to them, beckon to them, to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my holy ones. I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath, those who rejoice in my triumph. Listen, a noise on the mountains, like that of a great multitude. Listen, an uproar among the kingdoms, like nations massing together. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. They come from faraway lands, from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy sinners within it. The stars of the heavens and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty. I will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. Like hunted antelope, like sheep without a shepherd, each will return to his own people, each will flee to his native land. Whoever is captured will be thrust through and all who caught will, are caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be looted and their wives ravished. See, I will stir up against them the Medes who do not care for silver and have no delight in gold. Their bows will strike down the young men. They will have no mercy on infants, nor will they look for compassion on children. Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. But desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill her houses. There will be owls will dwell and there the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will howl in her strongholds. Jackals in her luxurious palaces. Her time is at hand and her days will not be prolonged. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Aliens will join them and unite with the house of Jacob. Nations will take them and bring them to their own place. And the house of Israel will possess the nations as manservants and maidservants in the Lord's land. They will make captives of the their captors and rule over their oppressors. On the day the Lord gives you relief from suffering and turmoil and cruel bondage, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. All the lands are at rest and at peace. They break into singing 
Even the pine trees and the cedars of Lebanon exult over you and say, now that you have been laid low, no woodsman comes to cut us down. The grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you, all those who were leaders in the world, to make them rise from their thrones, all those who were kings over the nations. They will all respond. They will say to you, you also have become weak as we are. You have become like us. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will rise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They wonder, ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home? All the kings of the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. You are covered with the slain, with those pierced by the sword, with those, with those who descend to the stones of the pit. Like a corpse trampled underfoot, you will not join them in burial. For you are destroyed in your land and your people, killed because you've, you've destroyed your land and killed your people. The offspring of the wicked will never be mentioned again. Prepare a place to slaughter his sons for the sins of their forefathers. They are not to rise to inherit the land and cover the earth with their cities. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord Almighty. I will cut off from Babylon her name and survivors her offspring and her descendants, declares the Lord. I will turn her into a place of owls and into swampland. I will sweep her with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord Almighty. The Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will stand. I will crush the Assyrian in my hand, in my land, on my mountains, I will trample him down. His yoke will be taken from my people and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the plan determined for the whole world. This is the hand stretched out over all nations. For the Lord Almighty has purposed. And who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out. Who can turn it back. So ends the reading of God's word. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to understand your word. It's, it's violent, Lord. It's aggressive. It's, it's hard to hear of such judgment. And that, Lord, you have made sure that we will hear it. Even on this day in your providence, teach us, Lord, from your word. We ask in Jesus' name. And we ask that we'll see Jesus even through this passage. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, time is uh, ever a rolling stream as the hymn goes on. It's a mystery, isn't it? Time is. Uh, the past was at one point the present, right? And the past was even once the future. And we know that the future will be present one day. And then it will fade into the past. And so we have broken up our thinking into past, present, and future, haven't we? And it's a mystery to us. In, the Bi in Bible prophecy, though, the past is not just about the past. The past is not just about what's happened, about Babylon. It's also about our present. It's about 
it's a precursor to the future as well. The future that God has planned. And so as you were reading that, I hope you were seeing kind of a, as it was about Babylon, but then at times it would go beyond Babylon. It would talk about the whole world, wouldn't it? It goes back and forth, almost like a zoom lens. It would zoom in on Babylon for most of the time, but then it would pull out and the angle would come out and it would be talking about the whole world. You see, the past for Isaiah is not just his past. It's about God's plans. The judges that are spoken of here are previews of the coming judgment. They're actually previews of all the judgments throughout the history of the world. The day of the Lord is this kind of elastic term that mentions not only the two nations mentioned here, Babylon and then at the very end, Assyria, but it is uh, about also the final day, not just their day. It's about the world. It, it's about Babylon. Look at verse 1. It's about Babylon. And yet, in verse 11, it says it's upon all the world. I will punish the world. And so it's about both. And we saw this last week as we looked at Jesus talking of the 70 uh, AD judgment of, of Jerusalem and of, 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 uh, that happened and how that was a precursor, a preview of the final judgment. And we're seeing that here. And I want you to pull out this chiasm outline that I've given you. Now, a chiasm, remember chiasms are, we tend to think in terms of chronological things. We tell a story, and when does the point of the story mentioned? It's mentioned usually at the end, right? We move to the end. Well, a chiasm has the point of the story in the middle. It's a different way of thinking. But they thought that way. And I want you to point out, because it's pretty clear to see in this in this passage in the first 16 verses God's sovereignty and holiness is talked about uh, there in his judgment of Babylon and beyond the world and then it comes back to his sovereign judgment on Assyria in the very last of several verses in 1424 and following his sovereign not just in holiness but he's sovereign over everything and then the next section comes if you come back up to the second section b1 as it's called babylon is judged by the medes verse 17 says it's the medes who are coming and then we parallel that with the starting of verse 3 in chapter 14 with babylon taunted there in the first section 17 through 22 uh there we find a dying kingdom, but in the 14.3 uh, and following, we find a, a, a dying king. And, what, and each one is telling us of God's judgment. But in the middle is the core, it's the nut, meat of the nut, as Martin Luther would put it. The sovereign grace of God in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 14. This is what we're to take away from it. Not just the judgment that will come and has come and will come and, and, and eventually will, will come on the final day but that the God is a God of grace in the midst of all this. All right, let's look, go through this, just, and I'll just summarize as we go through these couple of chapters. If you look at verses 1 through 5 of, of chapter 13, God is pictured here as a mighty warrior king mustering his army together, rallying the troops. That's what going on top of the, the banner on top of the bald hill is, is so that everybody can see that you're to come to that location and the troops are being rallied. And that these people who are rallied are called holy ones. They are set apart for God's purpose. In other words, they serve as God's instrument. God uses the nations for his own purposes, even in now, even in judgment. And then in verses 6 through 8, we see the psychological effects of, of this judgment. There the, the, the whole world will fall apart for these people. Their hands go limp, their hearts melt. They're locked up in fear and agony, agony and, in, and shock and in disbelief. And in verses 9 through 13, we see the environmental effects of this. And of course, this is apocalyptic language. It, it's symbolic, but it's going to happen in the final day. Uh, it will become literal, I believe. 
And here, the sun and moon and stars are darkened, and the, the land is desolate, and, 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 and the, the earth, uh, heavens tremble, and the earth, earth shakes off its place. The, the world is coming unglued is the description here. And it may be that the stars and moon and sun being blocked out on such a day of judgment was a way of thinking in ancient culture when a city was conquered and burned and was burning the smoke would rise and would block out the sun and the moon we know that from our fires our recent fires it's similar imagery it's the day of god's anger isaiah says though god is acting on such days now why is it happening why is god acting why is there such a a day like this the day of the lord on god's calendar why does God send judgments? Because they're deserved, is the Bible's answer. That's the simple answer. Because, because evil must be stopped. Because sin can't be endured forever by God. And we all know this deep down in our hearts. We all expect judge, justice. Where does that justice come from? Problem is that we just think Judgment should come on other people, not on us, right? That's our problem. But God looks deeper than we look, and therefore he knows better. He knows it is not only just to judge the ruthless like the Babylonians and Assyrians were, or those who are out, out of control and need to be restricted and stopped. But even the proud and the haughty those who put themselves in God's place, those who live as if they are God. Did you hear that theme throughout? It's a judgment not only upon Babylon and Assyria, it's a judgment upon the proud in these chapters. Now, why is pride so punishable? Why does God oppose the proud? Because he's made all of us to reflect him. We're made to reflect the God who has made us. We are like moons, and yet we act like we're suns with the source of everything from us. We are creatures, not the creator. And pride says this is not true. Pride says that I can defy God. Pride says that I can stand in his shoes and be my own God. It's what Bab Daniel talks about when he talks about Babylon, about Nebuchadnezzar, who looked over his palace and his kingdom and said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my power, mighty power, he says, and for the glory of my majesty. And at that moment, God struck him. Remember that? Chapter four of Daniel. That's what pride says. Pride says that I will never be judged. I need not be judged. What's not the like about me, right? Pride never, never repents. And this is why Babylon was judged. That's, this is why there will be a judgment in the future. This is why there are partial judgments all through the history of the world. And this passage brings it out better than any other. And it then goes on to say that there's no escape from this judgment. Look at verses 14 and 15 and 16. You can't run from God's wrath. You'll try to run. They'll try to run, but they'll be hunted down. They'll try to get back to their homeland. They'll try to get back to their security. But when they get back there, it's going to be just a disaster for their family. They'll lose it all. And this is not telling us that God kills babies or that God rapes women. It's a horrid picture of the runaway sinner in verses 14 through 16. Of the runaway sinner who ends in anguish in the end. Runaway sinners eventually run into hell itself. Well, that's the first section in chapter 13, verses 1 through 22. I'll skip the second section. I want to go to, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's, that's the first section. The second section starts in verse 17. And this is what will happen to Babylon particularly. The zoom lens comes in in verse 17. The Medes are raised up. They're his holy ones. They're his, their instrument. And they with the, the Persians sack Babylon in, three, uh, in 539 BC. 
This is a prophecy. Isaiah uh, writes 150 years before that this happens. And yet he writes about it by the power of God. God's word comes true. And it's interesting from the ancient sources that the fall of Babylon was taken without a fight. There was a battle as recorded in one of those sources outside of Babylon, but the city itself was taken without fighting. Exactly what Daniel 5.30 says, that Belz remember the, the writing on the wall that Belshazzar saw and, and, and it said that he's going to die that very night and he does. That's the fall of Babylon. And the prophetic lens though goes wide angle. It zooms in Bible and it goes wide angled back and forth. But the Medes here are ones who, as it zooms in, they, they love blood more than money. In other words, they can't be bribed. They won't be bought off. They're going to come fiercely with no compassion. And will come upon the proud. They'll come quickly. And, and Babylon fell quickly, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, just like God, God said. Xerxes finally leveled the city of Babylon in 439 BC and no one has inhabited it since just like God said but in between before we go to the second part these two verses come out 14 1 and 2 this is the core this is the heart this is what we're to take away from this passage here Verse 1 of 14 jolts us from the horrors of hell and from the judgments of history to remind us of God's plan for his people. That though the nations rise up and though they, the people are proud and they carry on this way, God will never forget his own. And it, another prophecy is given. It's a prophecy of the restoration. Remember Israel was overcome in 586 and the temple was destroyed then. They were hauled off to Babylon. But then there was a restoration under Ezra and not Nehemiah later. And God did bring them back. Just like this passage says, aliens from Babylon will join them. People came back from Babylon, not only Jews. Nations assisted them, just like we read about in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. That they helped them build and rebuild the temple. And then later, the walls with Nehemiah. And yet it's a broader fulfillment here that in Christ, Israel possesses the nations. How does Israel possess the nations? In that the gospel goes to the nations. And those who, who once ruled them, the nations, come to them as the early church to hear the truth of the gospel. They come to them for, for life. The early church was Jewish. Just like this passage says, we come out of Jewish roots because that's the way God wanted to do it. And so the gospel is this wondrous reversal where the captors become captives, captives by grace in this case, where the nations come to the gospel and rally to Zion to hear the good news of the gospel. This is picked up in the New Testament as in Ephesians chapter 2 when, when we were not God's people. We were aliens outside, but now as Gentiles, believers in Christ, we're brought in and made like Israel, become part of them. Once we were not God's people, now we are God's people. See the reversal of grace, of God's plan. He brings back Israel in the 5th century and or the late 6th century, but he brings even a greater fulfillment of the nations coming to Christ and becoming captives of grace. All right, now we could stop the sermon here and you pretty much get what I'm saying, but I'm gonna, I want to give the whole thing. So you come back to, to the, the next section, chapter 14 through 13, I mean 14, 3 and following. And here it's not the dying kingdom of Babylon, but here's the dying king of Babylon and it's depicted as a taunt you know taunts are not right in football you get penalized for taunts right but you, <laughs> you can you can have a, a godly gloating there is such a thing as a godly gloating over evil and that's what you find here 
in these verses. Like the song of Moses after the great deliverance from the Red Sea, so we find a taunt here that there's deliverance, that, 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 that the church's oppression is over now. And the weapons of the wicked are, are all broken. And even the trees rejoice. That's a great image because the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians always came from the north. They're to the east, but they always came from the north because of this desert in between. And they would come into Lebanon first. They would come into the northern part and they'd chop all the trees down to make siege works to come against Israel. That's what's being referred to here, but that's over now. They're not cutting down trees and the trees are delighted about it. They're delighted about it. And then we find this vivid picture in verse 9 to 14. The king of Babylon enters the grave and, and meets death. It's metaphoric. And it's showing that he's just like every other king. Every other king goes down to the grave. The king of Babylon will go there as well. He's just as weak, just as defeated, just as rotting as the others. And then we find that verse 12, which many people think that is talking about Satan. It probably is not, although it applies to Satan. It's talking about the king of Babylon in the context here. The Latin Vulgate translated it Lucifer because that was the name for Venus, the morning star. And so we've kind of made the connection. And you can make the connection. It's our right application. But in its context, it's talking about the rising up of any king or really anyone in their own pride, they'll be brought down. They'll eventually be brought down. See the, uh, the five all uh, I wills there are contrasted. You won't be able to do this. Remember when uh, Sudan Hussein was captured and I still remember a picture of him coming out of the a hole he was hiding in with a big beard, with kind of a beard and disoriented. Made me think of this. It won't even be recognizable. They'll say, is this the same guy that caused such pain and torment? Is this the same one? It's all to show he's going, they're going down. They won't even be buried. I won't go into all the detail of that, but they're, they won't even be able to be buried as verse 18 talks about. And this is not just about the king of Babylon, but all the wicked, all those who, who reject God and think they're better than God and they don't need God, all those who stand up in pride against him, they're the ones here that will be forgotten with no inheritance, will not rise again. And if this is you, then this passage clearly says that God is against you. He's not for you. That's what verse 22 says. Or verse 23 of 14. God will, will sweep you away like a broom or with a broom. And is this what you really want? Is this the life that you want? Is this, is this how you want to end up? Be warned from this passage that like Babylon fell, so will the world one day. So will all the nations one day. So will all the peoples. Don't fall with them. God is the God of all the earth. He's the king of all the nations. And God has a plan. In this final judgment, which is almost more about life than about judgment, in verses 24 and following, God's plan will come about God's plan can't not come about. His purposes will stand. You cannot change them. They're like gravity that he created. You can't come against it. You can't fall off the world because gravity holds you here. God's promises are like that. God's purposes are like that. You can't change them. And God will bring down the proud eventually. But the, the flip side of this is that he also frees the humble. God does have a plan. He will carry it out. He'll, he'll, nothing can keep him from carrying it out. And this is good news and bad news. The, the bad news is, is the main purpose of this passage is, the, is that the plan of God 
is judgment for those who oppose him. The plan of God is that all the proud who do not love him and will not recognize him will go down. All those who serve other gods or serve themselves as a god will go down. That's the bad news about God's, uh, God's purpose and God's plan. But the good news is that there's also a plan of salvation. That's what's emphasized in you know, 14 verses 1 and 2. That all who come to him, he'll never forsake them. All who, who humble themselves before him and commit themselves to him and trust him, he will take the burden off. You don't have to bear it anymore. The burden of your sin, the burden of trying to be the macho man or the perfect woman. You can't be that. I can't be that. We need to let go of our proud pride. He will raise up the humble. And this can be you. You, you can't turn his hand back, but you can take a hold of his hand in faith. You can come to him and come under the hand of his protection, which he offers to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, God is not just determined to judge, he's determined to save too. That's the good news. And he will receive all who come to him in Christ and he'll welcome you because he's paid for your sin. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it says, that it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But contrast that to Isaiah 65, where the Lord says, I am here, I am here. All day long I have held out my hands. Don't be that obstinate people or person. Right now God is holding out his hands to you. Come into those hands, come into those hands. God has a plan. His hand reaches to the, to the furthest end of the world. This, you should get this. He's sovereign over all. His hand reaches into all the earth. But that same hand can reach you in salvation too. It can re release you from your oppression of your sin. It can free you. It can deliver you from all evil. Jesus said in John 6, this is the will, this is the plan of him who sent me that I should lose none of all that he has given me but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Oh, don't be proud. Don't be like Babylon. Don't stand with the nations who resist God. Humble yourself. Come into his kingdom. Come into his freedom. Come into his arms. Because in Christ, he has shown you that he has a plan for all those who believe in him. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would help us now to hear the, the, the thundering noise of your judgment from this passage, but to also hear those simple words that you will again come to your people and choose Israel. Oh Lord, we know that you have chosen all who come to you. And yet you say that all that come to you will never be, never be turned back. May each Christian come to you, come back to you and realize that you are fully committed to their salvation. May we humble ourselves, forgive our, our relapses into pride, Lord, thinking that we really are doing it. And aren't we really wonderful? May our eyes turn to you. And may our eyes turn back to your pro prophecy that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen. Our Lord gives us in tangible ways what we are to have heard in the gospel this morning. Uh, come back to Jesus this morning. Come to Jesus this morning. That's the message of his word and it's the message of his sacrament. That we're to remember what he did for us and to come back to him and renew our commitment once to him and realize that he is forever choosing us, forever coming to us. And to lay aside our pride. Now, our Savior did that. He laid aside and became the humble one for us. And through his humility, our salvation came about. And he calls us to humble ourselves. There's a great freedom, a great wonder in humbling yourself before the mighty God, the true and living God. Humble yourself and receive the bread and the cup. As he has said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is for those who are saying that, who are believing that, who are confessing that. If that is you, come to the table this morning. If it's not, then come to Christ this morning. It can't be clearer <laughs> that you need the Savior. And the judgment only awaits you if you delay. But that Jesus took that judgment for sinners. Take his promise and believe it this morning. Let's pray. Lord, help us, we pray, to come before you by the power of your spirit to take this bread and this cup in believing that you are speaking to us by it. You are communing with us through it. That we belong to you. That your presence and your love and your covenant is with us. Because and as we take this bread and cup. Lord, nourish your people. Strengthen your people. Through it we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he did take the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take our our bread and our cup out of our container. This is the communion of the body of Christ. Take of it together. And brothers and sisters, this is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take of it with joy. Father, we thank you and receive your son and all the salvation that he has procured and for us and planned for us. Oh Lord, we give you praise and glory. Now may we go forth as glorious ones, as ones who have the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. May we go forth uh, in that great triumph but may we be humble all the way, knowing that it's all by grace. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy, be all the glory, power, and dominion, both now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>